It's 4 p.m. on Friday, September 5th here in Korea. Thanks for joining us live from Seoul. I'm Na Hyun Kyung. We begin with the exodus of Koreans heading home for the Chuseok holiday weekend. An estimated 40 million people will be on the nation's highways, byways and railways over the next couple of days. That's up 13 percent compared to last year as people aim to make use of this year's extended five-day holiday period. Travelers hoping to get an early jump on the rush began packing train and bus stations earlier this morning. Most tickets for destinations in the south of the country are sold out for Saturday and Sunday. And as of now, the roads are not that congested yet. It takes about five hours by car from Seoul to Busan. The roads are expected to be the most congested tomorrow morning, according to the Transport Ministry, and on Monday afternoon as well when many people will begin their journeys back to the capital region. And President Park Geun-hye has vowed to do her best to breathe new life into the domestic economy so that all Koreans can lead happy lives. That was in a Facebook video message where she said just like the full moon, she hopes the nation comes together in a full circle to boost the economy so that all Koreans can enjoy prosperity and happiness. President Park then went on to thank those who have to work over the holiday, including policemen and firefighters, and wished them, along with the entire nation, a warm and happy holiday. Over in Wales, NATO leaders wrapped up the first day of what's being referred to as the most important NATO summit in more than a decade. There, the leaders called for further sanctions against Russia over the situation in eastern Ukraine. Our Son jung in has this report. Amid talk of a possible ceasefire between Ukrainian forces and pro-Russian separatists, NATO leaders in Wales are voicing their support for Kiev and their opposition to Moscow. The 28-member alliance on the first day of their summit called on Russia withdraw its troops from Ukraine and end what it called the illegal annexation of Crimea. We strongly condemn Russia's repeated violations of international law. Russia must stop its aggressive actions against Ukraine, withdraw its thousands of troops from Ukraine and the border regions, and stop supporting the separatists in Ukraine. While NATO leaders mull their options, they are set to announce a new round of sanctions against Russia that target the banking, energy and defense sectors. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko is speaking optimistically about the chances of a ceasefire. He said a truce on ending the five-month conflict was contingent on the outcome of a scheduled meeting in Minsk Friday, where envoys from Ukraine, Russia and the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe will meet for talks. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. And another issue topping the leader's agenda in Wales is how to deal with the rising Islamic State threat in Iraq and Syria. U.S. President Barack Obama and British Prime Minister David Cameron are calling for united actions in confronting the group. Our Kwon Soa has more. NATO leaders are figuring out how to respond to Islamic State as it continues its rampage across Iraq and Syria and executes and threatens more Westerners. U.S. President Barack Obama and British Prime Minister David Cameron want an international coalition to combat the extremist group. The two leaders outlined the need to tackle the, quote, brutal and poisonous militants and urged powerful regional players like Jordan and Turkey to join the effort. Jordan's King Abdullah expressed strong support for such a coalition during private meetings, according to participants at the summit. NATO Secretary General Andres Fo Rasmussen said he would seriously consider requests for assistance from the Iraqi government, adding the international community has an obligation to stop IS making further gains. The British Prime Minister told CNN that his country supports U.S. airstrikes in Iraq and could take part in them, but also made clear that other factors like helping the Iraqi government and supplying humanitarian aid is just as important. I think sometimes people think there is no strategy unless it simply consists of airstrikes. That's not the case. What you need is a fully formed strategy to squeeze this from every angle, and that's what you're getting from this conference today. 
The United States and Britain need to find partners fast to form a coalition to battle IS through military power, diplomatic pressure, as well as economic penalties. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. And back here on the Korean Peninsula, North Korea may have reconnected its plutonium production reactor at its Yongbyon nuclear test site. That's according to the International Atomic Energy Agency. Washington is calling this a clear sign that Pyongyang is not ready to denuclearize. Here's our Shin Se-min with more. In an annual report posted on its website, the International Atomic Energy Agency says it has seen releases of steam and water from a reactor at the Yongbyon nuclear complex. The latest update on the plant also quoted experts that said the North could be working on making plutonium for atomic bombs. The UN watchdog said it was continuing to monitor developments at the site via satellite imagery. The reactor site has technically been out of operation for years as North Korea destroyed its cooling tower in 2008 amid a trust-building phase with South Korea, China, the U.S. and other neighboring countries. In April 2013, the North said it would revive its old 5-megawatt reactor at the Yongbyon nuclear complex. Experts said then that it would take about half a year to revive the plant, but only if it hadn't fallen completely into disrepair. In January, the U.S. Director of National Intelligence said the North had enlarged the uranium enrichment facility and restarted the reactor as well, calling the moves a significant step in the wrong direction and a contrary move to the North international commitments. The U.S. State Department said on Thursday that the activity signaled Pyongyang's clear lack of commitment to denuclearization. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Meanwhile, Washington has reopened the so-called New York diplomatic channel with Pyongyang to discuss the release of three Americans detained in North Korea. U.S. Chief Nuclear Envoy Sidney Seiler says the capture is a significant obstacle in improving their bilateral ties. Our Hwang Sung-hee has the details. A matter of days after North Korea granted U.S. media a rare interview with the three American detainees, the United States said it had restarted its own diplomatic channel with the communist regime to secure their release. Speaking at a forum on Thursday, Washington's new chief nuclear envoy, Sidney Sither, said efforts to bring the U.S. citizens home are being made through the New York Channel, as well as the Swedish embassy in Pyongyang. The so-called New York Channel refers to meetings between North Korea's U.N. delegation and U.S. officials. Seiler noted the three detainees have posed significant obstacles to U.S.-North Korea ties and urged Pyongyang to act in a humane and right way. Washington may not be alone in seeking to remove these barriers to friendlier ties. Letting CNN and the Associated Press interview the three Americans could be Pyongyang's latest attempt to push for fresh dialogue with Washington. North Korea has a history of using U.S. detainees as negotiating chips for talks with the United States. The latest developments come a couple of weeks before North Korea's foreign minister travels to New York City for the U.N. General Assembly. Attention is focusing on whether his trip could bring the two foes a little closer together. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. And it's not just the U.S. wishing to engage in a dialogue with North Korea. South Korea has called on the North for the third time to accept its offer for high-level talks. The Unification Ministry says it's regrettable Pyongyang has not given a response yet and added that Seoul wants all inter-Korean issues to be resolved through dialogue. South Korea proposed a second round of high-level talks last month to discuss a possible round of reunions for families separated since the Korean War, as well as other pending issues. The ministry said an answer from Pyongyang would be great news for divided family members ahead of the Chuseok holiday. Authorities are looking into a threatening package that was addressed to South Korean Defense Minister Han Min-gu. The Defense Ministry says the parcel included a 33-centimeter-long knife, 20 grams of flour and a letter which threatened to track down Han's family and, quote, 
seized him. The sender said he would punish Han for wagging his tongue, which would bring about a nuclear war on the Korean Peninsula. Authorities have released a surveillance footage of the suspect obtained from a convenience store where he appears to be sending the package and are currently trying to identify him. A similar package was sent last year to the previous defense chief, Kim Kwon Jin, who is currently Korea's national security advisor. So people here in Korea are already in a holiday mood as this year's Chuseok is an extended five-day holiday starting tomorrow. And of course, that's when people prep for the holiday meals. But our Kim ji reports that an increasing number of shoppers are shying away from the nation's traditional markets. The government has been investing billions of dollars in the nation's traditional markets for more than a decade. But the efforts don't appear to be working to counter the rise of major supermarkets. According to data collected by Senri Party representative Kim An Pyo, total sales at more than 1,500 traditional markets nationwide was slashed in half in 2013 from 12 years ago to $20 billion. They're losing business to more modern supermarkets whose total sales have been on a steady rise over recent years, hitting $44 billion in 2013. The shift has increased calls for more government support for traditional markets. More than $3 billion of government funds have been directed toward making traditional markets more accessible by modernizing their parking lots and entrances. But lawmaker Kim in his report pointed out that the money could be invested more wisely, such as by updating smartphone application software to make it easier for shoppers to find the markets and pay for their goods. He added that more research needed to be done on finding ways to help these traditional markets. Kim ji Arirang News. And instead of going home, many Koreans have opted to travel abroad this year. For those that do, you might want to keep in mind that starting today, duty-free limits for those returning to Korea will be raised. The move, which is part of the finance ministry's tax revisions, raises the duty-free allowance to 600 U.S. dollars from 400 dollars. It's the first time the ceiling has been raised in 26 years. The government also plans to raise the limit for domestic travelers to Korea's resort island of Jeju to the same level early next year and tax deductions of 30 percent to travelers who voluntarily report items that, that exceed the limit are planned to be in place while additional taxes will be imposed on those that don't. Now, one of the world's leading trade shows for consumer electronics will officially open in Berlin later the, on this Friday. The event will showcase the latest must-have gadgets, and one of the top attractions this year are said to be TVs. Our Hwang Ji-hae takes us to the scene. Some major electronics companies, including Korea's very own Samsung and LG, are set to show off their latest high-end gadgets in this year's IFA, one of the world's largest consumer electronics trade shows that's held every year in Berlin. Of course, if you consider the trends in the TV market, it's UHD, the ultra-high-definition TV uh, sets. Of course, it's the curved TV brand new in the market and every every of the big manufacturers will present their own curved TV and overall it's the connected world connectivity it's the big trend for everyone in the market and connected devices are taking center stage we have a Spotify Connect speaker where you can stream music through the Spotify app. We also have various Bluetooth solutions for multi-pairing. By this, I mean you can connect several Bluetooth devices at the same time and also play music. 
Japanese manufacturer Toshiba is no exception unveiling a television that acts as a digital personal assistant when you team it up with a smartwatch. It also doubles up as a mirror. If you have this digital watch, for example, then the watch sends body mass data to the TV so you can see how many calories you used yesterday, how many steps you took, what exercise you have to do today. The TV can tell you in the morning by looking in the mirror what the weather will be and what meetings you have. The five-day expo kicks off on Friday with more than 1,500 exhibitors from around the globe taking part. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Now they are full of protein and easier to digest than beef, but most of us cringe at the thought of seeing them, much less even uh, think about eating them. But it may not be too long until we see them on our dinner plates. I'm talking about insects. Here's our Yudian with this next story. Could we be eating insects as part of a regular diet in just a few decades? The UN Food and Agriculture Organization suggests that it might be a necessity. In a report, the agency said the world will need twice its current food supply by 2050 and said eating bugs would help stave off the effects of a crisis. And Korea is already taking steps in that direction. Officials from the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs said Thursday that a total of seven different insects could be cleared for sale in markets, including beetles and crickets, by 2016. The insects might not just be used for food, but for medicinal purposes and pest control. It's an industry the government expects to grow to about 684 billion U.S. dollars by 2020. Local hospitals like Yonsei Severance have already begun researching how insects could be included in patients' diets as they're good sources of protein and are easier to digest than meat. Insects are also known to contain good fats that include calcium and iron. Yudian, Arirang News. I don't know about insects, but uh, in other news, the world's largest Taekwondo center opened on Thursday in Korea's southern city of Muju. The new space will offer many different martial arts programs for people of all abilities and all ages. Our Kim Hyun Bin takes us there. Korea is the birthplace of one of the most well-known forms of martial arts, Taekwondo. So it seems only right that Korea had the largest Taekwondo center. The opening ceremony for this new facility in Muju, Cholabukdo province, in Korea's southwest, was held on Thursday. Over 2,500 visitors and distinguished guests, including Prime Minister Chong Hong Won and other top government officials, attended the ceremony. Highlighting the government's efforts to make the facility a global Taekwondo mecca, 200 masters of the martial art from 16 countries were given medals for their efforts to globalize the sport. We established the Taekwondo Center to globalize the sport and make this center a mecca. To fulfill our goal, we will offer a variety of Taekwondo programs and help globalize it through international exchange. Local residents are also proud to see such an amazing center of sporting excellence set up in the heart of their community. As a Muju resident, I am pleased to see the opening of the Taekwondo Center. The center was established and represents Muju, the Republic of Korea, and will be a good chance to promote the sport around the globe. The world's largest Taekwondo Center is built on over 2.3 million square meters of land, 10 times the size of Seoul World Cup Stadium, and is capable of accommodating 1,400 people at once. The center also has interactive facilities where visitors and pro athletes can hone their Taekwondo skills. Visitors can enhance their basic Taekwondo skills through numerous interactive activities and also get to spar against virtual reality fighters. At a cost of 240 million U.S. dollars, the center also includes the world's largest Taekwondo arena, a museum, an experience hall, and many other points of interest. Kim Young bin Arirang News, Muju. Bringing you the fresh updates from stories breaking in Korea and abroad. We give you a bigger and better picture of the world. Join Na Hyung Young live from Seoul every weekday only on Arirang.
Local health authorities have quarantined a Nigerian national who landed in Korea on Thursday over suspicions that he may have contracted the Ebola virus. The man who departed from Qatar had a body temperature of over 38 eight degrees Celsius upon arrival. Despite the fears, however, health authorities have uh, said that their preliminary examinations indicate he doesn't have Ebola and point out that he lives hundreds of kilometers away from the area in Nigeria where the virus has been most prevalent. They said more conclusive test results would be available later in the day. And staying with Ebola, an American aid agency is donating an additional $75 million for protective suits and beds in the treatment centers in West Africa. This, as the Associated Press reports, nurses in Liberia only have rags over their heads to protect themselves from the virus. The U.S. Agency for International Development had earlier committed about $20 million to fight the outbreak that has now killed more people than all other Ebola outbreaks combined. The group also said several hundred more international experts are needed on the ground to stop the spread. Now, it was a rather unexpected move, but the European Central Bank cut its benchmark interest rate to record lows to spur economic growth and prevent the faltering eurozone economy from slipping back into recession. The bank lowered its main interest rate to 0.05 percent from a previous record low of 0.15 percent. ECB President Mario Draghi also announced a new stimulus program to buy financial assets and private sectors in October to spur investment and growth. The last time the ECB made a rate cut was in June. Now, on a somber note, a new report by the World Health Organization shows that one person dies as a result of suicide every 40 seconds. Economic factors are usually pointed as the reasons for people taking their own lives. Our Kim min reports. Over 800,000 people commit suicide worldwide every year. That means someone takes their own life every 40 seconds. A new report by the World Health Organization showed low- and middle-income nations accounted for about 75 percent of all cases around the world. It stated the most common methods of suicide range from self-poisoning to hangings to the use of firearms. The report explained that restricting access to means of suicide is effective prevention as seen in developed countries, adding that governments need to come up with stronger measures. Only 28 countries are known to have national suicide prevention strategies. By age, the WHO said the suicide rate was the highest among those aged 70 and older and that suicide is the second leading cause of death in young people aged 15 to 29. Margaret Chan, the secretary general of the WHO, said the report is a call for action to address a large public health problem which has been shrouded in taboo for far too long. The WHO added that another way to prevent suicide is responsible reporting by media. The report comes ahead of World Suicide Prevention Day on September 10th, which raises awareness about suicide and suicide prevention around the world. Kim min Arirang News. Good afternoon, I'm Michelle Park here with the latest weather forecast. It's a beautiful fall-like end to the week as well as for people going home for the Chuseok holiday and the skies are looking very clear nationwide except for some clouds hovering down in the southern regions of the peninsula. And with the clear sunny skies, temperatures have risen to the uh, mid-20s to the low 30s making it feel more like summer. However, there is calm breeze as well which is making things a bit less hot. Now looking ahead to the night, it's going to be chilly with about 10 degree temperature drops putting them mostly in the high teens to the low 20s. So make sure you have a light sweater or a jacket 
with you at all times just in case. Now going over to our temperature readings. Seoul will peak at 28 this afternoon. Meanwhile, the southern cities such as Gwangju and Busan will be tad hotter at 30 and 29 degrees. And moving over to other regions, Jeju Island peaks over to 27, Tokyo hits 28, while Mount Kungang lingers in the 30s. Now that's all for Korea. Now here's a look at the weather conditions around the world. That wraps up our newscast. Thank you for watching. I'll be back with more at 6 p.m. Korea time.